The content of this podcast is provided for general informational purposes only and is not intended as, nor should it be considered a substitute for professional medical advice. Hello, this is Karen Nickel, family nurse practitioner, and you are listening to Itchy and Bitchy, a podcast that provides answers to your many unanswered health questions. I want to remind you about my course for perimenopausal women. After speaking with lots of women who are in this phase of life, I have developed a comprehensive course to help address the symptoms that so many women experience in their 30s, 40s, and early 50s. I launched the prototype, the live version of the course, on January 31st of this year and have completed the initial version of this course. Yay! Um, So it's all, the initial version is done. Anyway, I am now working on the final pre-recorded version of the course that will be available for you to take. It will live on a course website called Thinkific, so you'll be able to take the course at your own pace. I would love to talk to you about the course and see if it is the right fit for you. There is a link on our website, Itchy and Bitchy, and our Facebook page, INB Podcast, where you can schedule an appointment for a Zoom call with me. I am so happy, once again, to have with me my dear friend, my brilliant journalist, David Allen. Welcome, David. Karen, it's always great to be with you. Always. Is it really? Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> well, David, on a previous episode, I talked to my listeners about a 2022 study that revealed that taking estrogen early in menopause and for at least five years is neuroprotective, meaning it protects your brain, protects your nervous system. And now, hallelujah, another study was just published to confirm those findings. Yeah, hallelujah is a great word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Long I time know. coming, buddy. Long I, I time. I understand. I understand. I know your medical practice. I had a big focus on HRT for women. And is improvement in cognition when using HRT something that, say, you observed in your own practice? Absolutely. And it's that fact has been clear to me for over 15 years, 18 wow. years, uh, yeah. that my patients receive cognitive improvement when starting a balanced HRT regimen. So many perimenopausal and menopausal women suffer from brain fog. I have heard those two words endlessly, brain fog. And so the initiation of HRT really helps with that brain fog. I've seen it over and over and over again. So what what is Karen explain what is brain fog? What do you mean when you say brain fog as a as a clinician? Well, I think well, you know, most women when they say brain fog, they mean they can't think of words, they have poor recall, they mm-hmm. um have poor decision making, they uh their brain feels stuck and you know, like they just can't process things. They feel like they have ADD right. or dementia or both. Right. Um, because the, our brain cells need estrogen to function right. Uh, you guys don't have to worry about that. That's another okay. uh, That's another pro you have in your column. Check. Don't worry about Check. it. <laughs> Check. You are A-OK. All right. Good. Mm-hmm. It's the estrogen that is so, so um, important in women and and having you know, good, really good ability to think about things and, and make decisions and, and speak clearly. And I mean, people will, women will say, you'll be at a restaurant and say, can you pass me that bottle of red stuff that you put on French fries? But they can't think of the word ketchup. It's that kind mm, of thing. Right. And, we um, we end up just describing it <laughs> instead of right. giving it the word. <laughs> Stuff on French fries, I see. <laughs> Have there been... Which uh, really could Karen, be anything, but yeah, I think right, most right. people... <laughs> right, Most people assume ketchup. Yeah. I'm curious to know, Karen, if there have been um, uh, many studies about hormones and brain health. Well, as I said, we had that one last year and in 2022, and then this newer one. Um, but studies on women's health, especially regarding hormones, are really, really few and far between. And um, I think we've talked to about 
that stud, that um, Women's Health Initiative study that was in tw- 2002 on Primarin, and it really did a disservice to a lot of women because it mm. Mm-hmm. The study showed you should just not take hormones, basically, and everybody got ripped off their hormones. It was terrible. Um, but now at this point, we're finally getting some studies that really show what an, a balanced HRT regimen or, you know, that's not horse urine estrogen. Oh. It's, you know, these are actually in the studies they use hormones that are identical to what our body produces. Ah, I see. Right. So, I mean, right. there were, anyway, that was just a terrible study. But, right. um, you know, they're finding out in these studies that how HRT is beneficial, beneficial and when it's most beneficial to start it, which is a really important mm-hmm. thing, and how long you should take it. So right. have you, do, do, do studies on women come across your desk as a journalist very much? Or are we, are we just a mystical we don't get involved in anything kind of stuff, group of people. Well, I would say that I'm always very curious about medical studies in particular medical studies about women because of my wife and, and, and my daughter. And one thing that tends to jump out at me is just how much women are underrepresented in research in areas like in cancer and cardiovascular disease and psychiatric disorder and, uh, we know that uh, we still see that women are dying from preventable problems during pregnancy and childbirth, that women are consistently diagnosed later than men and experiencing significantly more adverse drug reactions. And I'm guessing that there's gender inequality, and this gender inequality not only impacts uh, girls and women, but but primarily their, their overall health. You tell me, doctor, what do you think? Well, yeah, because, you know, if you don't have a lot of women included in the study, I mean, forget HRT, forget right. that part. Mm-hmm. If you're not, if you women aren't well res- represented in a study, for instance, like for hypertension, a hypertension med, a med right. for mm-hmm. bl- high blood pressure. If we're not rep- well represented, we're taking doses that were studied on men. Correct. Yeah. You know, so that, it just doesn't work that way. So, it, mm-hmm. it, but especially, I mean, I think it's much better now, but certainly when I uh, started 22 years ago, a, a lot of studies were predominantly men. They ha- would, they'd throw some women in there, but um, not enough to really give us a good idea of dosing, the optimal dosing for women on medications in clinical trials. It's really sort of frustrating, but... Yeah, so it, it it really impacts the makeup of the participants in the studies makes a huge difference in terms of um, the best treatment for women. I, and, I digressed a little bit. I digressed what? a little bit. On, you did? On, yeah, well, I mean, you asked me a specific <laughs> question. I kind of took you a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. So uh, I'm just, uh, I'm curious as uh, what is this particular study that we're talking about and what uh, what you know? What conclusions did it draw that you think make uh, the clinical experience better for women and, and outcomes better? Well, the study, and this is the one that was just released in January of 2023. The study is called Alzheimer's Research and Therapy Study. It's sort of a weird title, but anyway. Um, and so it investigated the role of APOE genotype and age at HRT initiation and the cognitive response to HRT. So they're looking for a correlation between what genotype you are in terms of APOE and what benefits you receive um, in terms of brain health when HRT is initiated. So it's a pretty, pretty neat thing that, I mean, it was a really well thought out study. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I've got to ask you now, so what is APOE genotype and, and why are they uh, looking at this gene and the use of HRT? Explain to me what, what the connection here is. Yeah. Well, let's look at APOE genotype first because I, I don't want to get too complicated into genetics, but I, I hope the way I explain it will be clear to everyone. But um, APOE genotype, first of all, is involved in making a protein that helps carry cholesterol and other types of fat in the bloodstream. And that becomes important in a little bit when I talk to you about 
the different types. So problems in this process are thought to really contribute to the development of Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So we, we actually have different types of ApoE genotypes, and all of us have it in our body, these genes. So um, there are three different genotypes. One is ApoE2, ApoE3, and ApoE4. So we have a two, three, or a four. So you get one gene from your birth mother, and you get one gene from your birth father. So the combinations of the two genes can be a two and a two, a two and a three, a two and a four, a three and a three, a three and a four. You don't have to memorize this, people. Hang in there with me. And a four with a four. The ApoE4 genotype, which would be either the two and a four, or the three and a four, or the four and a four, is the one that significantly, significantly increases your risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. And this is especially true if you're a four, four, if you have two fours. If Mm, each parent gave you an ApoE4, they're at the highest risk. But even just having one ApoE genotype um, is which increases your risk, not as significantly as a 4-4, but it does increase your your risk. And and recent studies suggest that the problems with the brain cell's ability to process fats or lipids may play a really key role in the development of Alzheimer's. And, and those people with one or two copies of the ApoE4 gene, remember we're looking for the four, have tend to have increased buildup of cholesterol in their brain cells. And it's again, all about that transport of fats and and cholesterol. So the ApoE4 people tend to, it all gets jammed up there and and it collects on the brain cells more significantly than people who do not carry an ApoE4 genotype. So that's uh, that's one problem that happens with ApoE genotype, ApoE4 genotypes. So what kind of dementia risk are we talking about um, in those people that you just talked about, the four, the numbers and three, especially uh, women who carry uh, one or two copies of the ApoE4 gene? Well, David, I will answer that excellent question after this little break. Oh, wow. Suspense. Suspense. Woo. It's sort of a sad statement, but Americans spend an average of 90% of their time indoors. According to the EPA, indoor air can be two to five times more polluted than outdoor air. And in some cases, it could be a hundred times more polluted. We take about 20,000 breaths per day, and with each breath, we are inhaling possibly polluted air. And airborne allergens are the most common allergy triggers. I live in East Tennessee, the allergy capital. I always say that if you want to make an excellent living, become an allergist and move your practice to East Tennessee. So, of course, my husband, my son, and myself suffer from allergy symptoms, especially during our beautiful springtime. But never fear, there is a solution. Air Doctor filters out dangerous contaminants and allergens so your lungs don't have to. Air Doctor uses an ultra HEPA filter that's been independently tested to remove 99.99% of tested bacteria and viruses, including particles as small as 0.003 microns. That's pretty darn small. Their classic Air Doctor 3000 purifier, the one I have, is powerful enough to circulate the air in a 630 plus square foot room four times per hour. Air Doctor features whisper jet fans that are 30% quieter than the fans found in ordinary air purifiers. I plugged in my Air Doctor 3000 and my husband asked, have you turned it on? True story. Air Doctor comes with a no questions asked 30 day money back guarantee. So if you don't love it, just send it back for a refund minus shipping. So head to airdoctorpro.com and use promo code itchy. And depending on the model, you'll receive up to 39% off or up to $300 off. Lock this special offer by going to airdoctorpro.com and use promo code itchy. Whoa. 
welcome back. Uh, before the break, you asked me what the dementia risk is in women who carry one or two copies of the ApoE4 genotype, and the risk is significant. The lifetime risk of dementia for a 55-year-old carrier of at least one ApoE4 gene, so either a 2-4, a 3-4, or 4-4, was estimated to be 26% lifetime risk for men and 46% lifetime risk for women. And for non-ApoE carriers, at the similar age, the lifetime risk was estimated to be 11% for men and 28% for women. So it's still higher for women, but not 46%, which is crazy. And and just as a side note, um, it, it is interesting that those people who have a 2-2, two, two, they have a two from their mother, two from their father, it's a very small group of people. So actually, we don't have a lot of data on these people because it's such a small portion of the population, it's 2% of the population, they seem to have lower risk of developing multiple sclerosis and possibly lower risk for Alzheimer's. They're not sure what that protective effect is for a 2-2, but they are seeing that pattern. I just thought that was sort of interesting, but anyway, but 46%. Wow. That's, that's eye-opening. And yeah. the difference <laughs> between men and women. You So a 46% lifetime risk for dementia in 55-year-old women who have the ApoE4 gene. Okay, that seems pretty high. Your reactions suggest that you agree it's pretty high. So you said that they were looking at the role of HRT in women with this particular gene. I'd be curious to know what they found. Yeah. Well, the Alzheimer's Research and Therapy Study found that introducing HRT in women is associated with improved delay memory. And delayed memory is... Uh, meaning you have improved ability to recall specific uh, information after a period of rest or distraction from that information. So you learn something and then you go off and make a cup of tea and fry up an egg and da dee da da and somebody asks you later what about that information and you're able to recall it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's what de- delayed... Um, memory is. And then also noted in the study were larger interhinal and amygdala volumes in ApoE4 carriers only. So in other words, when you added HRT, they didn't see significant improvement in these areas in the ApoE2 and the ApoE3 groups, but anybody who carried an ApoE4 gene um, saw significant improvement. And and when we talk about brain volumes, you know, our brains shrink as we age, sort of sad to say. And we look Very. at, yeah, I know. Very <laughs> we, disheartening. I know. <laughs> and we look at, you know, CT scans of the brain or MRIs of the brain. You see, you know, this little, you know, shriveling little brain in there with lots of room around it. You know, it's it's, it's sad that that happens. But um so gaining, so gaining volume in the amygdala and the interhinal areas are, um, that's a really significant finding because uh, the interhinal is responsible for spatial memories, including memory formation, memory consolidation, and memory optimization during sleep because we do work on our memory while we're sleeping. Um, so, and the amygdala is responsible for emotions, survival instincts, instincts, we sort of need those, and memory. And so both are in the medial temporal lobe, so that, and it's deep in the brain, you know, toward the center of the brain. The amygdala we have on, the, on both sides, the right and the left, and the interhinal is only on the left. But, um, and there's little tiny p- parts of the brain, but real deep in there. So anyway... It, it's well, pretty pretty interesting that they were memory. able to f- see that in that study. Well, 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 Karen, speaking of memory and my shrinking brain, <laughs> um, I'll take a, a risk here and say that uh, <laughs> didn't you tell me in a, a previous conversation that more than two-thirds of Alzheimer's disease patients are women? 
Yes. Oh, oh, and we've just now started to figure out, oh, maybe has estrogen has something to do with that. Oh, yeah. Oh, perhaps. and I was seeing that clinically in my practice. 15 years ago. A Four long months. time ago. And yeah. we're now just going, oh, wait a minute. Maybe there's, maybe there's something to that. Well, that other study I told you about in 2022, mm-hmm. they actually are studying because they think this will be the optimal way to use estrogen in women. They're they're starting a study using um, inject, injections of estrogen into the brain. What? Yeah, they're they're doing that study. So maybe I'll volunteer for that. How did they do that? I don't, I don't know if they put a little um, shunt in there and and a bathe that of some kind. Yeah. Now, see, wow. that the problem with that, they're going to have to figure out a better way to, to do that after that study because, you know, people aren't going to do that. I'm not going right. to sign up for that. <laughs> I mean, unless they're really desperate. Right, yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah but it's interesting, yeah. huh? Just bathe that brain in estrogen. Yeah. So we're finally, finally looking at the role of estrogen in this statistic and finding out what the lack of estrogen does and how, what kind of role it plays in the development of Alzheimer's. So 2022 and 2023, we finally have something to look at in terms of estrogen in the brain. Yeah, I'm just curious, Karen, um, were there any studies at all before 2022 that had similar findings at all? Yeah, there were some early observational studies and that ob- observational means you don't give any treatment to the people. You just mm-hmm. just sit and watch their brain shrink. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know? So, okay. uh, <laughs> you know, they're just observing people and how they age and, you know, what seems to affect this or that. Um, but they're not given any medication to that would affect the outcome. Mm-hmm. So um, those observational studies showed that oral estrogen may be protective against dementia and with a risk reduction of 30 Four percent in an early review of several studies. So again, these were not. This is a meta-analysis. They're looking at several studies. They were observational, but just in observing, they saw that taking oral estrogen redu- reduced your risk for dementia by thirty-four percent. And the stu- studies also showed that there is a critical window for starting oral estrogen. And it's likely in the transition from perimenopause, the time right before menopause is what that is, and menopause. Mm -hmm. And during that transition into menopause is the time when when estrogen gradually declines, increasing the likelihood that the brain will develop Alzheimer's. And again, this is what we see clinically when we specialize in treating perimenopausal and menopausal women. I mean, it's, it's, I hate to say this term, it's... It's definitely we need a drum, but a bum. But it's it's a no brainer. I mean, you know, I mean, it's right, just right. it was it's just, and that's why they could deduce that from observational studies because you know that's that's what I observed over my clinical time working with menopausal and perimenopausal women. So another analysis revealed that women who started HRT earlier and had less apparent brain aging. There's that shrinking again, compared yeah. to later starters. So the earlier the earlier they started their HRT in menopause, so as soon as they went in menopause, they had less shrinking of the brain. And importantly, this effect of HRT timing was the only evident in APOE4 carriers. And so this raises the notion that the interaction of APOE4 and HRT initiation might have a significant effect on the brain health later in life. And this recent study proves, I mean, they were sort of seeing that pattern in these observational studies. And then this 2023 study really has confirmed that. Yeah, it's sort of amazing. But so, yeah, so, so we had something, but it wasn't really, a, you know, a, a double blind study like we would do for any other medication. So this seems significant and I'm sitting here wondering, so how do you find out what APOE type you have? And is this one of those situations where people say, 
Uh, I want to know, but I don't want to know. I only want to know if I have the right answer. It seems like, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's you true. know what I'm saying? And I totally yeah. get it. I totally get it. But, and I wouldn't encourage people to do that testing until I read this study. And then I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't force anybody to do it, but I would let them know about this study and how significant the benefits were for people who are ApoE4 genotype. But but some people just don't want to have this testing done because they don't want to find out. And they don't, they just don't, especially Alzheimer's. People are so afraid they're going to get Alzheimer's. They're, they just don't want to see the end of the plank as they're walking up to it, you know. Mm-hmm. So they often will just don't want to know, but it's worth considering seriously because it could help in your decision making as to whether or not you use HRT early in menopause to help protect your brain. Because another thing is after that WHI study, the Women's Health Initiative, everybody's afraid of hormones now. So um, because we because we typically see in the media the detrimental things. Uh, about hormones. We don't typically see these things where, look, if you take estrogen early in menopause, your brain won't, will not only not shrink as much, it'll actually get larger, the important pieces for memory in any way. And you, you won't have, um, you want to have the shrinking of the brain and you'll have better memory recall. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, but so I would, I would, um, I would bring up that study to patients and and tell them how significant those findings are. And and there are there you know you can ask your primary care provider to order the ApoE genotype with a blood draw. It's a blood test. Um, but many insurances have no or minimal coverage for genetic testing. And your provider also may not be willing to do it because they're like, I don't know what to do with that. I don't know what how to advise you. If you get this test, but now this wasn't happening when I was starting this, looking at into this 18 years ago, you can now get, um, testing with a cheek swab, um, that you can order yourself for APOE genotyping. And, you know, there are those 23 andme things that a test that test for boatloads of genetic, um, malformations or genetic uh, mutations, um, I probably would just recommend getting just the APOE so you're not overwhelmed with all that genetic information. But um, And there are companies that offer uh, just an APOE gene test like Empowered DX, Empower DX. They do a, sw- a home swab test and um, it checks for all the combinations of APOE genes. Um, and including the, you know, all the APOE4 genes and it's $99. So it's pretty affordable. Um, there's RX home test that all that's what, that's the name of the company RX home test. And it has an APOE genotest. test. That's $919 direct value dispense. That's the company direct value dispense has genetic test kit for APOE only for 99 bucks and life check. And it's life is spelled L Y F E. Life Check has an APOE kit also for ninety nine dollars. These are all cheek swab testing, so it's easy. You don't have a blood draw. You just take a swab and run it inside your cheek and mail it back. And lo and behold, six weeks later, you'll know your genotype. Typically, it takes about six weeks. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So you have a wife. Mm-hmm. And you have a daughter. Right. Um, so do you think about these things with, uh, you know, because there are all these, the, you only have, besides you, you only have women in your family. Um, so is that something that comes across your mind uh, now and again in terms of women's studies, in terms of hormones, any of those things? Well, for sure. I, I think information and, and, and knowledge is, is power. I mm-hmm. think we all should be advocates for our own well-being and, mm-hmm. and, and health care. Uh, I think we need to be prepared to ask people we see uh, 
in the clinical setting, uh, intelligent questions that, that uh, get us the answers that, that we need. Uh, so I definitely think that knowledge is is important, and um, the right knowledge is even more important mm -hmm. than when it comes to our health. So it is. Um, that's something that I would encourage my wife and daughter to definitely uh, mm -hmm. stay engaged. You know, don't be an observer. Be be an advocate for yourself. Be able to identify what you're feeling and and be able to communicate it so that you can get the best advice you could possibly can. Absolutely. And and your daughter, who's in her mid-20s, is fortunate because we are seeing better trends in terms of including women in studies, mm -hmm. and that's going to benefit her later in life for sure. So she's fortunate to be, you know, launching as a, an adult at this time in terms of the medical world for sure. Well, you know, Karen, I hear a lot about um, people talking about, you know, d dementia and, and mm -hmm. forgetfulness and whatnot. And, and people will say, I've got this perfect formula. I eat handfuls of blueberries every day. <laughs> Have chocolate. It's okay. Drink coffee. What about all of those things? What's, what's yeah. in that bag? Is, is that yeah. helpful at all? Yeah, and, and, some, and I'm sure many of you out there, many of our listeners have heard of these things. But the first thing, and I tell patients this all, all the time, learn something new learn something new, learn something hard. So because the hippocampus, we're now talking about another part of the brain, lies deep in the temporal lobe, and it helps process two types of memory, the one that allows you to memorize a play, or a speech, or a four hour opera, which mm -hmm. applies to David and myself. Right. Um, but that so the hippocampus is key in that um, type of memory. And the um, also the um, hippocampus helps us with a sense of direction. Uh, so you know where you're going when you get in your car to go to your grocery store. That sense of direction lies in the hippocamp in the hippocampus. And due to the way the hippocampus works, how many times can I say that and not like stumble, stumble? stumble? I've already stumbled on it. Right anyway, I'm leaving it to you. <laughs> <laughs> How many times can you say hippocampus in one sentence? I'm not trying. Anyway, <laughs> due to the way the hippocampus works, uh, when you learn something new, you build neural pathways, new neural pathways, and you strengthen the ones you already have. So that's what we call neuroplasticity, when we build those pathways. So you learn a new language. I know that's hard, but learn a new language. Learn to play a musical instrument. I mean... Whip out your kid's recorder and, and play that even because that challenges your brain. And we tend to sort of get sedated and, and think, I just want, I, that's too hard for me. I'll just do what I know best. Um, but that makes your brain lazy and doesn't stimulate neural pathways. So, um, and I understand it's challenging, it's uncomfortable, but let your brain be uncomfortable. Learn something new. Um, ac exercise. Everybody knows they're supposed to exercise for a bunch of reasons, but exercise actually will reduce all the risk of Alzheimer's by 50%. That might get people off the couch, don't you think? I would think. I would think. <laughs> it will me. <laughs> well, also eating fish, and that's mainly about the omega-3 fatty acids and uh, the highest the fish with the highest omega-3 fatty acids are like salmon or sardines, but you also have to keep in mind to avoid fish that are high in mer mercury, like bluefish, mackerel, marlin, grouper, orange roughy, shark, swordfish, and ahi tuna. Oh, oh no. I love ahi tuna. I'll just try to eat it less. Yeah. I don't eat a lot Moderation. of it right now. Moderation. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, the, there are studies that show that the hippocampus, I said it again, um, of those who eat fish once weekly is 14% larger. Your hippocampus is 14% larger than those who do not eat fish once weekly. The other one that was music to my ears is to drink coffee. Drink coffee because mm -hmm. it's been shown to prevent formation of amyloid. And that's the clumps of protein that form in the brain that 
um, contribute to developing Alzheimer's. And here's your blueberries, buddy. Um, and they contain super high amounts of antioxidants. And as we've talked about before in the podcast, antioxidants reduce the free radicals that are floating around in your body. And free radicals are linked to a bunch of diseases. So we want to get rid of free radicals for a lot of reasons. Um, and then, you know, you've always heard exercise your brain with card games, puzzles. You know, you see me do uh, jigsaw puzzles and on vacation and nobody helps me with them. Nobody. David doesn't. No. Aunt, my husband doesn't. No. Nobody helps. So maybe next next year you'll help me with a, a jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> well, we're helping you grow your brain. That's what we're staying out of that. <laughs> oh gosh. So um and we, you talked about chocolate, eat dark chocolate which releases dopamine. We all need a little more dopamine. You know, a lot of sure. neurologic problems are from low dopamine like um Parkinson's. So uh, that dark chocolate helps with dopamine and that's a neurotransmitter that is great for fast learning and memory. And you know, and it's a great antioxidant too. So it has a lot of win 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 win. Um, and practice mindfulness. I've talked about this for a lot of other reasons on the podcast, but meditation techniques increase serotonin. You know, that's why people take serotonin reuptake inhibitors to bump up their serotonin. And this neurotransmitter, we think of it for mood, improving mood, but it also is key for learning and creating new memories. And then change up your regular activities. We drive the same way to work, to the store, we go the same route, and, and, and it puts your brain in autopilot. I, I mean, I know I've done this, but I've, you know, been going toward work, and and I, I'm going to someplace not work, but it's the same direction, and all of a sudden I find myself at work. I'm like, oh, <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> But, you know, I think people just sort of, you know, they go on autopilot. They don't, it's sort of mindless. I mean, that, that probably doesn't ever happen to you, David. Well, I, Karen, actually, I've, I've, I've learned some bad news from all of this, and that is that my brain is shrinking. <laughs> but I've learned that I've gotten a, an excuse now for when I get lost. I can say I'm, I'm working on my cognitive skills. <laughs> Neuroplasticity. And, yeah, and that when I... My wife asked me to eat blueberries in the morning. I can say, let's just replace it with chocolate. <laughs> so that's. You're, that's a, you're an excellent student, David. Excellent. Yeah, I've learned a lot. And so, Karen, I would just say, so we've discussed a lot of stuff. But what is the what's the take home message for, for listeners out of all of this? Again, because women have a much higher risk for for and progression of Alzheimer's disease. It is essential that we have a more focused preventative approach in women. I, you know, I don't know why we don't focus on that, but we don't. And in the Alzheimer's and research study that we've been talking about through this whole podcast, it was demonstrated that APOE genotype and the age of HRT initiation are important factors in cognitive function and cognitive related brain volumes. Those are big. That's huge. It's, Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, also noted in the study was that women who carry the APOE4 gene are the most responsive to HRT. So if you have, again, if you are on the fence about doing HRT, and you have, especially if you have a family history of Alzheimer's, you may want to check your APOE typing. And if you're APOE4, it's something to put on the list of reasons why to start HRT. So, and a really important finding was that the earlier the age of initiation of HRT, um, the better people did in terms of improving the volume of their hippocampus, their interhinal, and their amygdala. So, you know, the, res the researchers report that, to their knowledge, this was the first study that demonstrates that HRT can have a beneficial effect on a range of cognitive. They did a bunch of cognitive function tests too, and that they saw improvement there, and also the cognitive um, related brain volumes in HR in women with APOE4. So we really de definitively 
found this out of the link between ApoE4 genotypes in women and HRT and the benefits you're going to gain. So just tuck this piece of info into your hippocampus. I got to say it one more time. Well, you did a great job. I didn't I? Um, yes. <laughs> if, if you're perimenopausal and are entering menopause or you have recently gone into menopause, starting HRT early in menopause helps you maintain a healthy brain and therefore can help prevent dementia. I think it's pretty important stuff. Yeah. I've learned a lot. Have you really? Oh, that's, yes, that's... absolutely. I <laughs> well, I thank you so much, David Allen, for you being bet. with me. Um, and bet. we're going to work on that puzzle, that jigsaw puzzle thing. I might get you to do it at some point. Um, and I really appreciate your joining me on this discussion. And many thanks to Air Doctor for sponsoring today's episode. I encourage you to visit our Facebook page, IMB Podcasts, where you can leave comments or questions for me. Our website is itchyandbitchy.com, and there are blogs on the site with some of our subjects available for you to read. On the Facebook page and website, we have the information on how to schedule an appointment with me so that we can chat about my perimenopause course and how it can help you if you're going through this phase in life. And as always, thanks to Forrest Winsel, our composer of our theme music and our producer and person who does everything other than the only thing he doesn't do is blab into a microphone I do that part um, so also he has an album out an awful lot and you can listen to that wherever you stream your favorite music or go to Apple Music or Spotify and download the album right there and remember your health is in your hands oh.